The main thing we do in thermodynamics is track energy. We should really call ourselves energy accountants because that's what we are. Think about a car going down the road. Well, you know that energy is certainly being consumed. The gasoline is going down, right? The tank level is going down. So surely energy is being converted from one form to another. It's not being lost. It is conserved but it's not still in the fuel tank so where does it go if your car is just moving at constant speed why would any energy be required to keep it going at constant speed well there are several places where energy is lost or energy leaks out if you will in many different places uh, you might wonder which one is the biggest I'll tell you at the end but let's think about it one of the first things people think of is potential energy if the vehicle goes up a hill well then, you know, that's going to take some energy to move the vehicle up the hill, to raise the mass of the vehicle in the gravity field. And that is true, but you get that energy back when you roll down the other side. So as long as your initial and final points are at the same elevation, there's really no change in the potential energy of the vehicle. And so that's not really a place where energy is permanently lost or goes away. Obviously, if you were coasting, as you coast up the hill, you would slow down. As you go down the other side, you would speed up. Another place people think of energy being lost is in the radiator because they know that the coolant from the engine is warm and air you know, comes across the radiator and cools the, the coolant for the engine so that the engine doesn't overheat. And yes, there is a decent amount of energy lost there. We can quantify that energy as MCP delta T just like we could quantify the potential energy changes of the vehicle as MGH. Another thing that people think about is rolling resistance. So rolling resistance is this idea that as things turn, there's some resistance somehow. Well, how does that work? Well, with tires, it's easy to imagine because with a tire, as you roll the tire on the ground, it is compressed. And the, the rubber in the tire acts like a lossy spring. So essentially what happens is when that, the, the rubber of the tire is compressed and it goes under the contact patch, uh, it takes energy to compress it, right? Because it's like a spring. It's force times distance. You've got to compress that tire. When the tire goes to the rear where it is expanding again, it will push off the ground to some extent. Here's the interesting thing. The rubber of the tire is lossy. In other words, the amount of force that it applies over distance as it's re-expanding is less than the force over distance as it's being compressed. And so that's why it's difficult to push your car if your car is stalled or it won't start and you're trying to push it. That's one of the main reasons. Rolling resistance is one of the primary losses, at least at low speed. Now at higher speeds, drag becomes a much more important loss. In fact, there's an equation here that shows that the drag force itself is the drag coefficient multiplied by the density of the fluid that the object is moving through, in this case air, times the square of the velocity of the vehicle through the air, the relative velocity of the vehicle with respect to the fluid, over two, times the cross-sectional area, which is the frontal area. It's the area you would see if you stood in front of the vehicle and just looked straight at it. Okay, multiplied by a characteristic length L. So uh, this, and I may have one thing wrong in that, it, that length may be the distance that it moves through, I can't remember now, it doesn't matter. The point is that the drag force increases with the square of the velocity. And so at higher speeds, you know, 80 miles an hour or so, the drag force is the primary loss. That is the main force acting against the vehicle. And you probably know that. If you ever took your hand and you stuck it out the window at 80 miles an hour, you feel the wind push your hand back very hard, right? Imagine the whole surface area of the vehicle and how much force there is uh, from that entire surface being pushed through the same fluid. So then how else, though, does energy either enter or leave the system? Well, the air that comes in the intake certainly has energy in it, right? The air is above a temperature of absolute zero and so it actually has energy. As a matter of fact, since it flows, it has something called enthalpy. And so the amount of energy that comes into this system from the air is the mass flow rate, or is the mass of the air times the enthalpy of that air. If you want to look at it as the rate at which that energy comes in, E dot, then that would be the mass flow rate, M dot, times the enthalpy. But the main place where energy leaves the system is in the exhaust gas. That's actually the primary place as long as the engine is running because the exhaust gases throw out a lot of waste energy. So the gasoline has a lot of chemical energy in it. Of course, that chemical energy within the system is decreasing because we're using it, right? Uh, but the exhaust uh, uh, gases come, coming out of the tailpipe take out energy with them 
that is, you know, carried in the exhaust. It, it's enthalpy still, but it's a tremendous amount. As a matter of fact, even if you have a, a fairly efficient vehicle, roughly 75% of the gasoline you pay for comes out the tailpipe as waste heat. That's a lot. That's that's a tremendous amount. So to make you feel even worse about it, when you go and you put a dollar's worth of gasoline into your car, about 75 cents or so does nothing for you, essentially. And so uh, while these vehicles are not super efficient, you might say, well, I wish I had a vehicle you know, that was 80-90% efficient. Yeah, that would be nice, but thermodynamics limits the efficiency of heat engines or engines that convert thermal energy to work by quite a lot, and that's what's being shown here. So depending on how fast you're moving, how hot the, the engine is, you know, all these different things, how much your tires are inflated, all these things are energy interactions that can either add energy to the system or take it away, depending on what the system is doing, whether it's sitting still, you know, idling, whether it's going down the highway at 80 miles an hour. There's going to be different flows of energy, but we're at least identifying the majority of them. So another way we could look at this van is as just a system that has energy entering and leaving the system. So you can see that there's combustion air entering uh, and then combustion products leaving. As we mentioned, one would be coming in the air intake, the other's coming out the exhaust pipe. The system itself, the van, has potential energy. It also has kinetic energy, which I didn't write in here. The energy of the system would definitely include the um, uh, kinetic energy of the vehicle. There's also the fuel that's in the vehicle. And I said minus the mass of the fuel times the lower heating value. I think I should have said plus there. The point is that this, this van system has some energy in it that we can account for. Obviously, the heat loss from the radiator is a cooling effect. So that's an MCP delta T type of term. And then the airflow, that is length. I remember now. W, I, instead of making that the force, I made that the work. Uh, that drag does. So the, the first bit of this equation from the drag coefficient all the way through the area is the drag force and then that length L is the amount of distance down the road that the vehicle moves through. Obviously this would be something that you'd have to integrate because it's going to vary over time but we're just looking at this as, at a high level and trying to understand that since energy is conserved if we could just figure out where all the energy flows are we could track them, we could account for them. Now there's many different forms of energy. We've mentioned some of these: kinetic energy uh, of a wheel, you know, rotating; kinetic energy of a body moving. But often it's more convenient to deal with energy in a a per unit mass or a specific way. So instead of saying, "Well, we've got this big car that has a kinetic energy of one half mv squared," well, how much energy does each pound of car have, or each kilogram of the car? How much energy does that have, the specific energy? Well, to do that, we would just take that kinetic energy, E, and divide it by the mass of the vehicle, M. And so if you take the formula for the kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, and divide it by the mass of the car, you just get v squared over 2. So the specific kinetic energy of the car is v squared over 2. You can do the same thing with the rotating uh, wheel, but I won't go into the details because we're not going to use that in this class. Potential energy, you could play the same game. You could say, well, potential energy is mgh, divide by m to make it per unit mass energy, and that would just be gh, the acceleration of gravity times the height uh, that the body is above where it could fall to, its potential. Now, if we're talking about thermal energy, where we have gas bouncing around in a room, let's say, or in a container, the bigger the container, the bigger the room, the more gas there is, the more energy there is. But how much energy does each kilogram of gas have? Well, that we will give the symbol lowercase u. So lowercase u is equal to uppercase u, the total system energy for the whole thing, divided by the mass that's in the system. Now, like I said, the system doesn't have to be, you know, a, a whole house, for example. It could be just a room in the house. Okay, it would still have the symbol u, and we'd just be talking about all of the energy in that particular room. We have to understand that that's, you know, we're talking about one room. But on a per unit mass basis, now we don't care how big the room is, whether we're talking about the room or the house or whatever. What matters is we're talking about how much energy one unit mass has in the thermal form. We saw before that total system energy has many different contributing sources, right? There was even nuclear, chemical, all these different things. But most of the time, the ones that we are interested in are the thermal energy, the kinetic energy, and the potential energy. Those three things are the most important. And of course, when we talk about flowing fluids, we'll, we will have flow energy as well. But for now, let's just consider these. 
So if we write the total system energy, most of the time these are the only things we'll include. Internal energy, U, kinetic energy, Ke, and potential energy, Pe. If we expand those terms a little bit so that we can you know, quantify and calculate each of them, we can't do much with U, the thermal energy, but the kinetic and potential energies can be expanded into a little more detail. Then if we divide this total system energy by the mass of the system, then we get uh, the specific form of the total energy. Now one confusion here is I've used three separate examples and I just mashed them all together. If we were applying this total system energy, say, to just the car, then it would be the kinetic energy of the car and the potential energy of the car as well as the internal energy or the, the thermal energy of the car because the, the car has matter and that matter is above a temperature of absolute zero. So it certainly has thermal energy. I didn't mean to imply we could take a system as multiple different you know, things that are chosen at random. So what can change a system's energy? Well, there are three things. There's mass flow, heat transfer, and work interactions. And so how do we quantify all of these things? Well, mass flow is pretty straightforward. Think about a pipe with a cross-sectional area, A sub C, and that area then would be pi d squared over 4. Now, I realize flow doesn't always occur in nice round pipes, but just for understanding the concept here, this is adequate. If you think about what happens here, there's, let's think of steam, okay? So the steam's flowing, it has some average velocity. The mass flow rate of that steam would be the density of the steam times the cross-sectional area times the velocity of flow. And then the rate at which that mass carries energy with it would be the mass flow rate times the specific energy, the amount of energy that each unit of mass contains, each unit of mass of steam. So if we multiply density times cross-sectional area times velocity, you'll see that we get mass per time as our units. That is a valid mass flow. But then if we multiply the mass flow rate, which is mass per time, times energy per mass, you'll notice there that the mass cancels and we get energy per time. So this is power. So this is the power. It's the rate at which energy is carried into or out of, in this case, through a pipe. Heat transfer, on the other hand, there are three different mechanisms of heat transfer. There's conduction, convection, and radiation. Hopefully you've learned something about these different mechanisms. But the important part is that they are all uh, transfer of energy due to a temperature difference. That's really what they are. And so the, the rate at which heat is transferred depends on the temperature difference. The, the bigger the temperature difference, the faster the rate goes. Radiation is a little bit different. It's not just directly proportional. Uh, but uh, anyway, the, the point is, as the temperature difference goes up, the heat transfer rate also goes up. But to clearly distinguish the various Qs that we use for heat transfer, capital Q just represents a, a certain amount of heat transfer. Let's say that, you know, let's say you come home and it's cold in your house and you need to heat it up. If you know how much air there is in the home, then you can actually calculate the quantity of heat required, Q, that needs to be transferred into that air to bring the air up to a comfortable temperature. But whatever you specify, obviously the higher the temperature you want, the, the more heat transfer would be required, the bigger Q has to be. But if you want to know how much heat has to be transferred into one kilogram of that air, then that's little Q, that's lowercase Q. So that's the, the amount of heat, capital Q, for heating up all the air in the home, divided by the mass of all the air in the home. That would be how much heat has to be transferred into one unit of air, so that's lowercase q. On the other hand, the heat transfer rate is how quickly the energy flows. You can have a tremendous amount of heat transfer at a very slow rate. It just takes a long time to accomplish. It's kind of like saying I could have a, a huge tank that I could drain with a trickle. Yeah, sure, if given enough time, the trickle will drain the, tra the tank. Um, but the difference between q and q dot Q is an amount, whereas Q dot is a rate. So think of Q as the volume in the tank and Q dot as the flow rate coming out of the tank. Obviously, the, the flow rate can change. It can vary with time. So if you wanted to relate the amount uh, of heat that's transferred to or from a system to the rate at which it flows, you have to integrate the flow rate over time. Now, most of the time, we don't want to integrate. And in a lot of systems, we can assume that the heat transfer rate is essentially constant. So then we can just multiply the heat transfer rate by the amount of time that the heat transfer flows to get the total quantity amount of heat that is transferred. There are many different forms of mechanical work. Uh, we'll talk about two to start. Translation and rotation are uh, ways to uh, 
distinguish the two. But in translation, you've already dealt with this probably in physics for a long time, where work is force integrated over distance. And really, it's a dot product between the force and the distance. The force has to be in the same direction or has to be the component in the direction of motion for it to be useful. So work is force times distance. You probably know that or it's the integral of force over distance. But if we want to talk about how much work has to be done per unit mass, we would take the total work divided by the mass of whatever system uh, work is being done on. If you think about moving someone, you've probably helped someone move and you know you, you pack the boxes too full because you don't want to carry too many and then it's too heavy to carry, so what do you do? Well, you slide it along the ground, right? So you're doing work, you're pushing a force on that box through distance and if you wanted to know how much work you're doing per pound of box, then you would just divide by the total mass of the box. Now, rotation can also be mechanical work. So shaft work uh, is a generalized force times distance where the generalized force is the torque over radius and the generalized distance is really the, uh, the, the angular rotation. So the torque times the angular rotation. So uh, we're breaking these up and, and clearly making them you know, a, a force because it's torque over radius and then a distance uh, trying to linearize this. But really what you need to know is that torque times rotation gives you work. So that you see there the 2 pi n would be the number of revolutions, t would be the torque, and of course the 2 pi is to convert revolutions to radians because when you multiply torque by uh, angular displacement, the angular displacement needs to be in radians for the units to come out right. So anyway, uh, if we want to talk about shaft power, for example, W dot instead of just W, the W is the quantity and W dot would be the rate, then we would need the rotation rate of the shaft, where the rotation rate of the shaft would be N dot. There are other forms of mechanical work. Uh, if you think about stretching a spring or compressing a spring from its rest position, the force that the spring applies varies with displacement. So if you're going to say work is force integrated over distance, well then we'd have to integrate that force since it changes as distance changes. And so the, since the, the force for a spring is just k times x, the spring constant times the displacement of the spring, we can plug that in for f, perform the integration, and you come up with spring work uh, in the uh, lower left hand side. Uh, actually, if from strength of materials, columns and things and things that we usually consider rigid could be thought of as very stiff springs and similarly uh, there's work required in order to stretch these things. So if you had a piece of rebar and you were applying a whole lot of force to it and stretching it, you're actually doing work on that spring and quite a bit because the, the springiness of it, the spring constant is very high. So you'd have to integrate the stress times area over distance because stress times area would be force. Electrical work is another form of work. People think of electricity as some uh, magical thing, and it, in a way there's a lot of things I don't understand about it that do seem sort of magical, but it's really a generalized force over distance because electrical work is easier, in fact electricity is easier to understand if you begin to think of charges as having potential kind of like height. That, that's why it's called electric potential. It's because you can think of it as height where you know, uh, the, the charge is at a, think of it as being at a higher elevation, it can fall down to ground level. And that's why ground is called ground, because there's a nice analogy here. But generally, when you have a, an electrical resistance, work is required to push charges through that resistance. That's why it takes an electric potential difference. And so, uh, basically what we're really doing here is elect letting electrons roll downhill through some small resistance. That's really all that's happening here. So another way to look at this is that the electric potential, the voltage, pushes charges through the resistance and they end up you know, going all the way down to ground. So the amount of electrical work done is equal to the electric potential in volts V times the charge in that's pushed through the resistance. That's the amount of work done by the you know, battery or whatever the source is of the electric potential and power. Now, we usually talk about electrical power itself, uh, and for that we need WE for electrical work with a dot above it to indicate that we're talking about a rate. In that case, you probably learned in your electronics classes that this would be V times I, the electric potential in volts times the current I. Now, one thing to know about current is it's actually a flow rate. It's a flow rate of charges. That's all it really is, and it's measured in amps. 
Because of Ohm's law, of course, you can rearrange the equation and make some substitutions if you're just talking about a pure resistive load. And so the electrical power is I squared R or V squared over R. Now understand that what we've, we're doing here is we're showing a system where we have an electrical resistance inside of that system and charge is flowing through the resistance and therefore energy is flowing into the system across the system boundary indicated by the dotted line. That <laughs> students often get confused and think that that solid box around the outside is part of the circuit, that it's just shorted out, and that's not the case. I should make the color different, I guess, to indicate that this is, or maybe put a, a roof on the top to indicate that this is a house being heated by an electrical resistance heater. But the point is the only part of the circuit is the wire at the top, the electrical resistance, and then the wire coming back out. Now heat and work have a lot of similarities. Both uh, heat and work are boundary phenomena. They are not things that are really properties of the system. Systems possess energy, but they don't possess heat and work. Heat and work enter or leave systems, and they, they move systems from one state to another. So both heat and work are associated with the movement, the process, not with the state itself. So both of these are path functions. They are inexact differentials. In other words, you can add, you know, you can transfer a little bit of work into a system, but depending on what path the system takes, the amount of work required to get the system from one state to another will vary. They are path dependent things. Okay? So when we add up all of the, the work done by a system, for example, we won't use delta W because delta indicates that we're talking about a system property. You might use like delta P, change in pressure, delta T, or you know, uh, delta V, changes in pressure, volume, and temperature. These are all properties of the system, whereas work is not a property. So saying delta W, the change in work of the system, makes no sense. It's kind of like saying that your bank account can uh, hold deposits, that there's somehow this continuous deposit coming in. That doesn't make any sense, right? Your, your account holds value at the bank, but what changes the value are deposits and withdrawals. Well, heat and work are deposits and withdrawals, nothing more or less. Okay, so don't get confused about that and begin to think that a system possesses heat or it possesses work. The reason I think students have this confusion is because when you think of temperature, right? You, you know things are hot, they're cold. You might have accidentally touched a hot stove when you were younger. You know when it gets cold outside, it's less comfortable. You th begin to think of temperature as heat. And our, our vocabulary and our language doesn't really help with this at all. Because we don't have good words to describe the thermal energy in things besides heat. And so I think this is the root of it. And what we're doing is we're breaking that association in this class where heat is only energy transfer due to a temperature difference. We're, we're, we're refining your understanding of this concept, right? And so the, the thermal energy, that's the energy that's left in a substance. As long as the substance is above absolute zero, it has thermal energy. And here's the interesting thing. I can hopefully convince you that thermal energy and heat are very different things. By showing you a very simple experiment, you can rub your hands together, right? And when you do that, what do you feel? Well, you feel warmth. Why do you feel warmth? Well, because there's more thermal energy in your hands. Where did it come from? Did you put your hands in front of a fire? No, you used work. You applied force times distance. So the work went in and was transformed into thermal energy. So we can make thermal energy without heat, right? Okay, so if you think about uh, sitting in front of a fireplace, that's the easier way to warm your hands. And it, it gives you the same effect. Energy is transferred to your hands, but it's transferred because of a temperature difference. Work is not a temperature difference, right? So anyway, systems don't possess heat. They don't possess work. Uh, and so the amount of work in getting from one state to another would be W sub 1, 2, for example, or 2, 1, depending on which way you're going. Whereas the change in volume of a system, we could write, you know, if we count up all the small changes in volume of a system from one state to another, we could simply, you know, we could either do the integration or we could just look at the initial and final states and take the difference in volume and say, well, that's delta V. So it's, it's a very simple concept. And like I said, I think what really confuses students is this subtle distinction between heat and thermal energy because it is different and it's important that you understand that difference. I hope I can convince you that the amount of work 
required is path dependent by the simple example. We talked about pushing a box across the floor during moving earlier and I guess when I made these slides the Wii was new so <laughs> these slides have been around for a while now but uh, you know I don't even know what the most recent console is but whatever I imagine you've got your brand new console you set it down on the table you're excited to use it and you need to move it to the other end of the table maybe your, your significant other or parent or whatever has told you hey this can't go on this end we're about to have dinner push it down to the other end and so you slide it maybe you'd realize that depending on the path over which you choose to slide this box the amount of work required will be different the amount of force times distance is different mainly because the distance is different right and so you should see that work is a path dependent function just like heat is a path dependent function as well and some paths require more work some paths require less so if we're going to be energy accountants then we should be able to account for energy right what does that mean that means that we should be able to balance things out how do you balance your bank account well the withdrawals and the deposits should predict your account balance right you add up all the deposits and withdrawals and that tells you how much the uh, uh, account balance changes in the same way we can write an energy balance where the total energy that enters the system minus the total energy that leaves the system is the change in the total energy of the system this is the same thing as your bank account balance let's say you start at a hundred dollars right you uh, allow twenty dollars to enter the account and you take ten out well let's see 20 minus 10 that's 10 that so that says there's a change of ten dollars in your account sure enough do the math it's hundred and ten dollars in your account right so it's simple so if energy enters a system and energy leaves just those deposits and withdrawals will change the amount of energy in the system it doesn't tell you what the energy in the system is it doesn't tell you the state of your account but it does tell you the change in state right now how do we deal with this change on the right hand side well obviously the system is going to go from one state to another and those states let's just label them state one and state two or the final minus the initial state and just like in your account balance before you could have calculated that your account went up by ten dollars by saying well i have hundred ten i had a hundred final minus initial hundred ten minus hundred it has changed by ten dollars right so you can calculate the change in the account balance by just looking at the difference in states because the account balance is a property of your account just like energy is a property of systems systems do in fact hold energy and that energy can be increased or decreased by by adding or removing energy so the you know just writing e2 and e1 that's not really detailed enough let's let's zoom in a little bit more and let's write the energy of the system in one state I don't care which state the point is that the system will contain internal energy U kinetic energy KE and potential energy PE which we can even drill down farther and write them uh, as you know U plus MV squared over 2 plus MGZ to represent those different uh, forms of energy that the uh, system can contain now since we needed the change in system energy we're just looking at the right hand side uh, of the equation then we're going to need two of these right the difference between the second and first states and so you can see here since the mass of the system probably hasn't changed we can write m delta u plus one half m delta of v squared minus v squared between the two states and so forth with potential energy as well so this is just expanding that right hand uh, side term in the energy balance to dr drill down to more detailed uh, view of it. Now what about the things that cause the change? What we've just done by analogy in the last slide is we looked at you know what uh, the account balance tells us and how you know given the account balance at one state and the account balance at another we can see how much it's changed but what is it that causes the changes well that's the left hand side that's the flows the things that go in and out of the system that carry uh, energy with them heat and work both carry energy into and out of the system potentially and mass flow can carry energy with it as well so we would write uh, instead of just energy in minus energy out in some you know vague uh, way we could write it as q in minus q out to drill down to the fact that 
heat can carry energy into or out of the system. Same thing with work. And then also mass, where we have the energy that the mass carries in, minus the energy that the mass carries out. All of these outflows, those are all withdrawals from our system, whereas all the inflows are deposits. So now, expanding the whole thing to look at all the gory detail, left-hand side deposits and withdrawals, right-hand side system state changes of energy, we end up with the equation you see there in the box, and I just pulled it from the last two slides. So you see all the deposits and withdrawals from heat, work, and mass flow. And on the right-hand side, you see how the system responds in changing its thermal energy, its kinetic energy, and its potential energy. And a lot of times, this form of the energy balance is not all that useful. What we would prefer to have is the per unit mass energy balance. So if we divide uh, the entire equation, left and right, by the amount of mass in the system, then you can see we're dealing with per unit mass properties, heat flow that's per unit mass, workflow per unit mass, and the energy each unit mass carries in or out. And then on the right hand side, the masses have all been canceled. We've talked about system states and processes and how you can uh, tie some of these processes together to make a cycle. What if we had a closed system that was following a cycle? It was just doing the same thing over and over again, and we applied our energy balance to it. Well, if this cycle ends up back where it started, then it's in the exact same state, and there's no difference between the initial and the final state. The initial state being state 1, the final state being state 1 prime, when we've gone around the cycle and come back to it. They're all equal, so the right-hand side would just go away. It would be zero. If this is a closed system, then there's no mass flowing into or out of the control volume, and so the only thing we would have are heat and work flows. And so we could write, instead of writing Q in minus Q out, we could write Q net. The net amount of heat transfer would be equal to the net um, amount of work uh, done on or by the system. Now this is actually really important because what it means is if we can make a cycle, then any heat that comes into this process or into this, this cycle, into the system, and does not leave as heat, has to leave as a net amount of work. And this really is the key to all heat engines. This is the way they all work. It's because energy has to be conserved. So if it comes in as heat and doesn't leave as heat, it has to leave as a net amount of work. Something that we're very interested in, though, is efficiency. I told you a little bit about, ago about how your car only uses, you know, 25 cents or so worth of the dollars worth of gasoline you put into it that's not very good so if we're going to talk about efficiency and try to figure out ways to increase efficiency we need to really understand what efficiency is and have some reasonable way of talking about it and and think about i guess you could say unintended consequences along the way now, there's something to learn here something very important the first is our definition of uh, efficiency or performance as far as we're concerned efficiency and performance are the the same thing and they are simply desired output over required input so what do you get out of it that you want, and what do you have to put into it to get that thing, okay? Uh, your desired output might be a nice car, right? The required input is money, right? You have to go buy your car. Well, efficiency, or not performance of the car in a mechanical sense, but the purchase efficiency would be how much car you get for how much you put in. Let's just restrict ourselves to, say, one car. Maybe there's one particular uh, model in here that you know you want to get. A, a, a better efficiency would be the car that costs less, that requires less input. Uh, let's look at the left image, the uh, uh, cooling tower there. A lot of people look at that and they think that this is a nuclear reactor. It isn't. That shape is a, um, a cooling tower and the idea that these are nuclear reactors was probably made popu popular by the Simpsons for one thing, but also by the fact that this type of cooling tower was uh, pretty common around the time that nuclear power was really getting a good foothold and so they were commonly used with nuclear power plants. But that, that hourglass shape does not indicate a nuclear reactor by any means. But let's just think about a uh, just a simple coal-fired power plant, okay? So the overall efficiency of this power plant would be dependent on the efficiency of several different processes along the way. Number one, when you burn coal, for example, or natural gas, or whatever you burn, the combustion efficiency is not 100%, right? There's, there's some unburned fuel left over. You can never burn it 100% completely. Now, you might get really, really close, but it's still not 100%. The biggest loss, though, is in the thermal loss, where 
thermal energy is converted into mechanical energy. What you're doing is you're you know, using hot steam to blow past turbine blades and turn a shaft. Well, that turning shaft is mechanical energy. You have converted thermal energy in the steam to mechanical uh, energy in the turbine. But then after that, that turbine is coupled to a generator and the generator is not 100% efficient. So we've just taken three simple things that you can easily understand, but there's many other potential losses along the way. Think about the loss in energy of the steam as it flows through the pipes, right? There's going to be some loss there as well. But the overall efficiency really is the product of all these things and ultimately ends up being the net electrical you know, energy generated divided by the amount of energy put into the system in the form of raw fuel, right? The, the heating value of the fuel. Now we could think of the higher heating value of the, or the lower heating value. It just depends on whether the fuel, you know, the water that the fuel generates is condensed out and actually converted to useful uh, electricity or not. Uh, probably I should have put the lower heating value here rather than the higher heating value, but the point is that the desired output is electrical energy, the required input is chemical energy, and the efficiency of the power plant is just the ratio of those two. Now let's talk about a water heater. You might look over at the uh, water heater on the right and say, well, what kind of water heater do I want to buy? Let's see, a conventional gas water heater is 55% efficient. A high efficiency gas water heater is 62% efficient, according to this data I've got here. An electric conventional water heater is 90% efficient. Wow, why would I even bother with gas when I can get a 90% efficiency? Or, heck, let's just go for the high efficiency electric water heater at 94% efficient. That's pretty impressive. Why would I not simply choose the high efficiency electric water heater? Well, you might, and that might not be a bad choice, but think a little bit deeper. When you take electricity and you convert it into thermal energy, it could be converted with 100% effectiveness or efficiency, right? I mean, there's nothing in thermodynamics that says you can't take electrical work or any kind of work and theoretically convert it to thermal energy 100% efficiently. I did that a minute ago when I was rubbing my hands together. Now, technically, yeah, I've pushed a little bit of air out of the way and that didn't contribute heating to my hand, but uh, you'd be hard pressed to say the efficiency is much less than 100% there. What about in this case? Well, sure, you can take in electricity. You can burn electricity, if you will. Unfortunately, that's what I'm doing. My water heater is pretty doggone efficient. Uh, I think it's on the side of it, it says something like 94%. It is a high efficiency unit. I wish I had a gas water heater. You know why? You might look at it and say, wait a second. Uh, it sounds like you just want to, you know, <laughs> you don't care about the environment. 55% yeah, efficiency is not good enough. You should do better than that. Well, I'd like to do better than that. Right? I'd like to get the highest efficiency I can, but here's a principle I understand. Where do you think that electricity came from? Not from solar panels on my roof, right? I'd like that too, but right now I just can't afford it. It came from a power plant somewhere, and that power plant does not have 100% efficiency. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the tours that I usually take my class on is a tour of the... Um, uh, it's a uh, gas-fired power plant over in Louisville that LG&E runs on Cane Run Road. It's a combined cycle plant. You don't know what that means yet, and that's okay. But this plant is amazing. It's, it's a modern plant. It was only built a few years ago. And the amazing thing about it is they've got an over 50% efficiency. So over 50% of the chemical energy that enters that plant via gas is converted into electricity. And that is utterly amazing. The coal-fired plant that they had, that they shuttered, uh, got up to, I think, about a 36% efficiency. So Either one of those, which, you know, to be fair, that coal and natural gas still provide quite a bit of our electricity, either one of those uh, options is already lower efficiency than just burning the gas directly. And here's my point. The more times you convert energy from one to another, the more of it is siphoned off and wasted as thermal energy. In other words, the more of that energy that gets misdirected and go somewhere where you've basically lost it and it's not useful to you anymore. So that 55% efficient gas water heater is actually more efficient than paying for electricity from the power company and burning it. Now it may not be more cost effective. The only reason I have an electric water heater is because it's what came with the house. I really would like to replace it because 
uh, it turns out that you could get a higher than 100% efficiency. We can't really call it an efficiency, then we have to call it a performance, a coefficient of performance, because you can get water heaters nowadays that have heat pumps on them. And what they do is they extract thermal energy from the local environment and concentrate it into the water. And so you can use the electricity in a much more intelligent way to concentrate free thermal energy that's all around you. And that's actually what my heat pump does, right? I have a heat pump for my house, and what it does is, as long as it's not too cold outside, it will extract thermal energy from the outdoors. It basically air conditions the outdoors in winters in order to warm my home. So you really need to dig a little deeper than just a raw efficiency number. You need to really understand you know, what all is going on and, and where energy comes from. And some of the principles, as I mentioned, like that the more times you convert energy, the more of it's going to be lost because you always lose some energy in conversion. And I don't mean that that energy is destroyed. I mean that that energy is irreversibly changed to low grade or low temperature thermal energy that's simply not as useful or as valuable as the energy you had before. Now we can talk about efficiency in the context of pumps and motors and turbines. In fact, we already have a little bit, but we can cast it in this this uh, you know performance or efficiency equation that we've got of desired output over required input. And the important part is to realize what forms of energy each one of these things are dealing with. A pump, for example, its job is to generate fluid energy, right? Fluid power. And so I've written the efficiency in terms of a two power ratios, right? You can write it in terms of two energies, you know, one over the other, or a power one over the other. And in this case, the pump, its desired output is fluid power, or a change in the power of the fluid flowing through it. And what do you have to supply a pump? Now, not a pump and a motor, but just a pump. You have to supply that pump shaft power, right? You got to twist the shaft at the inlet in order to generate or transform some of that uh, shaft power into fluid power. Now, the shaft power will not 100% convert into fluid power. Some of it's going to be lost. There's going to be friction in the pump. So some of it's lost as that irreversible thermal energy I was talking about before, low-grade thermal energy. So the more times you convert energy, the higher percentage of that energy is ultimately lost to a, a form of energy that's not useful to you. Speaking of motors, motors themselves convert energy. They convert electrical power, that's the required input, to shaft power. That's why you commonly see, you know, a, a electrical motor coupled to a pump because the pump needs shaft power and the electric motor generates shaft power. But now we've got two conversions. We've got the efficiency of the motor to think about, the conversion from electrical power to shaft power, and then the conversion efficiency from shaft power in the pump to fluid power coming out of the pump or changing the fluid power of the fluid flowing through the pump. So there's two conversions right there. Turbines, on the other hand, are kind of like the opposite of pumps. Not exactly, but they, in a, a, an energy sense, do the opposite thing, right? They, they extract energy from fluid power and convert it to shaft power. So you see that the desired output is shaft power. The required input is a change in mechanical power, non, or in mechanical, I'm sorry, is change in fluid power. You'll notice that we've got absolute signs in the denominator. That's because the, the fluid power is decreasing and we want the efficiency to be a positive number. Alternators or generators uh, obviously do the opposite of what motors do, right? They uh, take in shaft power and generate electrical power. So I've tried to lay these out so that you've got things that are commonly coupled together horizontal from one another and then opposites or vertical from one another. And I really just want you to see that there are many devices that convert energy from one form to another, but it's important to realize that every time you have an energy conversion, some of that energy is going to be irreversibly lost. And uh, not lost in the sense that it's destroyed, but lost in the sense that it's no longer useful for your purposes.